Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Alright, thang athletes, and welcome to the latest episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host, Malt Char, and um, well, the nights are drawing in, are they not? Um, so we're here to uh, hopefully warm you up a little bit with some 2000 AD chat. Uh, you may well have seen that the 2000 AD Encyclopedia is out in time for our 45th anniversary in February. On this episode, we talked to Scott Montgomery, who is the writer who has dived into the archive to bring you all the uh, kit and caboodle of uh, four and a half decades of the galaxy's greatest comic, all the way from RNA Yardvark to Zombo and everything in between. It's an absolute beast of a book. It's been uh, serialized in the supplements that came with the uh, Joseph Dread magazine over a number of months. Uh, and Feedback on those has been great. It's being collated and updated in a, a new hardcover, which you can pre-order now from 2080.com, as well as all comic book stores and uh, bookstores as well. Wherever you get books, you can uh, you can order this. So uh, it's great to chat to Scott about that. We also just got a, a brief, brief uh, uh, teaser for this weekend because it's Thought Bubble. The first thought bubble after after COVID, the first thought bubble after last year's event went wholly online. Um, the uh, 2080 is not there. We uh, donated our tables. Um, hopefully we'll be there next year, depending on what happens. But in the meantime, we decided to do the, tunnel, uh, the, the, tunnel, the talent search panels uh, online again, uh, just because the format works really well. You know, last year um, we picked two very worthy winners uh, and I... I I liked and we had a lot of feedback that said people liked the the the, the uh, how we did the whole thing on, on online. Also, it broadens out the number of people who can enter because you don't have to come to Thought Bubble to actually take part. So um, uh, we've got uh, Leanna Kangas, Doug Braithwaite, um, Olivia Hicks on the uh, art judging panel. And then we've got Maura McHugh, uh, Ram V and Oliver Pickles, who are the judges on the uh, script panel so i uh, got a brief bit just as a teaser for this weekend um tune into the thought bubble festivals youtube channel at the weekend to find out who actually won to see all the uh entries um i have to spend most of tomorrow editing those uh which will be fun um but yeah it, it's fantastic it's a huge number of entries for both competitions which is great to see and uh, of course the winners get paid work from 2000 ad which is great so the 2080 uh, Encyclopedia is out uh, in February. It's on pre-order now. So I sat down with Scott Montgomery, uh, the writer behind the Encyclopedia, to talk about the challenges of condensing 45 years of the galaxy's greatest comic into one book. Well, I, I mean, thanks for thanks for agreeing to to chat um, about the encyclopedia. Um, it's, it, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit how you came to be involved in the project. Right, um, I was just round about um, early March, uh, twenty twenty, and um, well, I'd done some articles for Matt Smith before, um, um, and I'd done things. I don't know if you're aware of that as well. I did like the some of the dread files from David Bishop when he maybe had other projects I wanted to do. So that was quite a while ago, back in 2007. So I've had um, sort of contact with 2000 AD for quite a while, um, but on and off through the years, you know, and it was all kind of article type things that I, that I did for them. And um, and so I got back in touch from, I, I used to work on Commando uh, and for DC Thompson. So that took up a, a lot of my time. So uh, I didn't really have a huge amount of freelance work on the go. So I'd kind of lost touch with Matt a little bit and so on. So when I, I decided to leave Commando um, five years ago, and uh, back to Matt, I was just trying to get some articles and things like that. And I'd done a couple of them, and then I um, was going to pitch some more around about the uh, start of 2020, when uh, Matt just said to me, um, we're thinking of doing an encyclopedia, would you like to compile it? So I said, um, oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Although, don't get me wrong, I, I have to admit, um, it was a little bit of, trepidation about just the, the scale of it, you know, and the sort of 
the responsibility of it. But then I thought, oh, of course, there's no way I can turn this down, you know. So, um, so I was delighted to to do that. But then, um, out of the blue, lockdown hits, and um, so it became a bit of a kind of mail back and forth about um, you know, just how we're going to do it and all this. So I said, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I do it. And then I was just again some kind of lucky circumstances that um, I had the time to be able to devote to it. Um, and I was working part-time just two days a week, so I had the rest of the week to be able to do an encyclopedia. If I'd had a full-time job, then I, I wouldn't have time, I think, you know, so very lucky there as well, you know, it's just you can't to ask at the right time. Um, but uh, unfortunately, lockdown, it became a bit of a sort of, um, uh, you know, how to do this and, um, you know, how we're going to actually have the resource. So that was one of, my, one of the reasons why I did it, I worry about it, was... Um, uh, a couple of house moves and stuff like that meant like unfortunately you do have to like I don't know if you've um, if that's happened to you but you have to end up junking a lot of your probes and stuff like that And um, unfortunately just, yes uh, yes yeah and I was like oh well yeah I can do this but I've hardly any resource material uh, research material but um, but Matt says well, well we can we can get around that you know there's um, he got me a electronic subscription I was able to sort of basically the last 20 years were covered definitely, so that was okay. And then, um, and then all the collected, luckily, with such a big program of collected editions, basically, you know, 90% material was there for me to be able to not worry about, not you know, not having, you know, two, three, five, or whatever to hand, or whatever. So, yeah, it was, it was kind of um, as, as, um, as straightforward as that, really. Just basically, Matt asked me if I'd like to do it. And, um, and after sort of worrying about it a little bit, I said, yeah, absolutely. And then we just got the way we got started on it was um having done the dread files I knew that um David Bishop had, had set strongly template for each say, entry in it. So I thought I have to try and do something similar. So um I thought I'll come up with a template which is say fiction, fact, um trivia, essential uh, essential stories and creators and Matt seemed to like that pretty much right off. And um it was just again sort of Sample entries, and um, he had some suggestions about maybe change or lose that bit, and um, and then I think we was ready to go to just get get started on the mammoth sort of task ahead. Let's talk about the dread files for a moment because that was a, a project that ran in the magazine, and mm-hmm. it, it ran for a while, but I mean it it eventually um, came to an end. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a, a little bit more about that? Because that, that was that was an interesting um, proposition from the start. You know, you just you you start at the beginning and describe each each dread story, I guess. Yeah, yeah. As I said, Old Lion inherited it from uh, Dave Bishop. Um, yeah, I think it was one of these things that yeah, that could just, that will go on forever. You know, I mean, it was one of these things that that doesn't end. You know, <laughs> but you know that well, that can stop keeping work. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was one of those things um, when I took over, we decided to uh, streamline it a little bit, just and we took out maybe some of the really minute detail that David had, and uh, we just sort of um, just tried to make it a little perhaps it took less space you know, I think when, when they, the initial run of it, it was maybe five pages or something like that, and when I did it, it was like say three pages so, so we just tried to maybe just streamline it down a little bit and I think um, the experience of that did, did make me think, well, actually, yeah, I think I, I can manage to do the encyclopedia if I have a kind of similar approach, obviously tailor it in a way that's going to suit the, the project itself. It, it's it's one of those things that I think um, always sounds quite straightforward, you know, mm-hmm. oh, nice mug. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, oh, you know, just yeah. uh, look at the characters right, right, and series, write things down. Yeah. But, 2000 AD isn't something that's preserved in aspic. It, it is uh, uh, something that has changed and evolved over the years. You know, characters pop in and out. Various things, uh, are, are, you know, are mentioned and then never mentioned. Never mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> um, what What were the challenges that you, you've encountered uh, putting this together? Right. I think, um, as you say, if you approach it, um, I, well, obviously the, the structure of A to Z helps, you know, enormously, because then you kind of know, and especially when it was serialised for the magazine. So I had to deliver, basically, you know, A to E, then say F to H or whatever, you know. So, like, I mean, that keeps me focused. That keeps the project from you know, from yourself going off and on tangents everywhere and stuff like that. But as you say, how do you actually, you know, nail this stuff down? 
Um, you, you, I think initially you have to look at the just look at it chronologically, and um, so if you're, but, and then you get the things that do become a bit of a nightmare, as you say, that when you're talking, like say, road trooper, or that where um, up until the hit, um, yeah, it, it had a, a linear um, sort of road, you know, and then, but then you start getting into reboots, and then with Friday and all that stuff, um, <laughs> yeah, it starts to become a bit of a headache, and and I'd already actually. Again, I'd already tackled that before as well. It does sort of history of Old Trooper or um, the action special that, that um, John Tomlinson did back in 1996. So, again, I had to form, if you like, you know, I said, right, okay, well, just approach it in roughly the same way and it should work out okay. And if I've got any queries, just um, just on that and then we can you know, work it out. You know, but I tried to sort of not bother him with Vineyard Shine because obviously he's running to magazines, you know, and... Uh, from yeah, and even worse, you know, in lockdown from home, he's like homeschooling and stuff like that. So he really, I couldn't just say, oh, Matt, what about that? You know, what about this? What about that? Well, you know, no, I have to kind of you know, take responsibility and sort of uh, make sure that I'm kind of responsible and, and sort of working it out for myself, you know, and not saying, oh, what about this and what about that? So I think it was, um, it was a matter of just approaching it and chronolo- reading everything that I can read chronologically and then just trying to pinpoint. Um, is especially for things um, when they're non-linear, like say when God and Rennie took over the the original road trooper for the sort of before the the traitor general died. Thought on that, and then I had to be a bit more kind of careful about that and say, right, okay, you have to kind of interweave these together chronologically as best you can. And then and hopefully that will still makes sense for people rather than saying, oh, that happened. No, but before he died, you did this and you have a kind of awful sort of way of trying to explain things. Um, does that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. See, it, 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 my, my next question was was, was going to kind of focus on that about, you know, you, you get some series, you, you named Road Trooper there, um, which are sprawling, you know, and, and haven't necessarily had um, a, a, a single authorial voice, um, have jumped and changed. I mean, the 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 nineties period of Road Trooper alone <laughs> is a is a bit of a quagmire. Um, mm-hmm. has, has has that just been a bit of that way? Just kind of synthesizing these things down to a, um, a a few sentences. Yes, yeah, I think so. I think you just have to sort of somewhere along the line just try and summarize it as best you can. Hopefully, that it, it makes sense to your average reader, who presumably is a fan, but um, you're hoping that um, someone who's just got into 2018, this is the ideal thing for them as well, you know, as well as someone who has been there from 1977 or, or whatever. So, um, I, yeah, you do have to sort of um, tackle those those um, details, but in a way that's hopefully not um, just going to grind people down and, and confuse them. I hope so. I've, done that. I've certainly tried to, yeah. Were there particular um, series or characters that uh, uh, you know weren't weren't covered by the subscription to the app and the collected editions? You were like, I can't find anything on this, or, or you know, things things were a bit spare. Yeah, um, yeah, things like um, anything that hasn't really been sort of digitised or, or redone for, say, magazine um, form and so on. So there was things things like, um, say, if you remember, Dry Run. Uh, um, I've forgotten who does it. Um, uh, Kev Hopgood drew it, yeah. Um, so, so things like that. I mean, um, but the thing is, I did say to Matt, you know, there's not a lot of material about this. I do, I do remember reading it at the time, um, and didn't particularly enjoy it. You know, I mean, that's you know, it's no, uh, no, you no, know, it wasn't a very memorable uh, series, put it that way. Um, so you just try and just um just do some online research and things like that, and ask Matt if there's anything else that he could, you know we can look at. Um, uh, yeah, other resources were like say TPO, Ethereal Power Overload, um, and you just try to just um ones like that. You just try and just um sum them up in a nutshell if you can, you know, like um just a, a um you know a brief sort of synopsis of what it was about rather than the kind of minute detail that I could go into if I had all the material. And you just want to make sure these things are covered. I think Matt wasn't too fussed about um dry run get dry run getting the same kind of like um 
in let's say um, grey area did or something like that. You know, um, you, you know that that's okay. I mean, these are curios and one offs and stuff. We want to we want to mention them, but we don't have to sort of um, uh, read every page. That's okay. I think that was all right. That was like kind of the, the approach to go. Just because we have the deadlines as well that has been serialised, so you know we don't have the luxury of say. Um, once lockdown lifted, I could have you know, dogs would and we get in and made pages or something like that, and you know, just wasn't going to happen. You know, I on a project like this, the, the the sheer amount of reading that has to be yeah. done just to just to get the basics is, uh, I mean, you know, uh, when I'm briefly in the office, I can walk into the archive and see all those red books and and uh, you know. M- most of the rebellion era isn't even in those red books. You know, we, we, we have all the individual progs. So it's, it's, it's quite daunting actually uh, yeah, when, when you're trying yeah, to do yeah. a research based project on something that's been going for 45 years. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as you say, it's so much paper, you know, um, which, is, which is great, you know, um, but yeah, that, kind of um, in terms of the approach, if anyone's interested in how I kind of tackled it on a day to day basis, well, um, I thought if I could do at least about a thousand words a day, uh, which isn't very much, I know. But um, that, but before that, though, you have to read. You could tend to be reading four hundred pages of, you know, progs, um, to or something like I, I mentioned grey area. That was one I wasn't that familiar with the story, so I had to really read every page basically. And yeah, it's and it's great. And um, but I just thought you know with some of the, you you can't win these things. You know you have to. You know, if the material's there and you've got the time to read it, then you really have to read it and then, so that you can nail this down properly. So, yeah, I, I had to kind of work out. Um, yeah, that's maybe, say, two, possibly three entries a day. The time you can break it down into a sort of working day and then work that up over a week. And, and it, it managed to fit okay with the deadlines. But there certainly were um, some days where you just felt that you, all you did was read all day and you didn't actually write anything. And that's... Um, you know, when you hear people talking about research and stuff like that, you think, well, research isn't right, and is it? You know, <laughs> well, I, I think I, I think everyone assumes it, it, it'd be like um like a movie montage of yeah. uh, you know you, you you sat there flicking through your, your books and then you're, you're typing away and nice and yeah, busy, for, but actually for ten seconds, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it can be quite a, a research projects can be quite a grind, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's overall, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I was, if you're going to, you, there's no way you could possibly go, oh, I've, got, I've got to read 2000 AD for a year. You know, I mean, that's like, that's, that's a dream job, you know, of course. Um, it is, it's fantastic. Um, but it is very kind of sort of time consuming and you have to sort of, um, as you say, narrow this down. Um, the research can maybe actually almost get in the way of the writing. So, yeah, well, discovered from that and you can say well if you've read all this stuff but if you haven't actually typed a word then you're, you've basically not done anything in terms of you know getting this to the editor you know what I mean well, you, you had the, the stuff going into the meg supplements um, over mm-hmm. the, the, the course of uh, the past year um, you mentioned that was good because you know it gave you structure it gave you a, a, a deadline but also I imagine the pressure on that is quite quite major uh, yeah, yeah, because um, really, um, you know, this is scheduled, so um, you, you, do, you really kind of, um, well, I, I know that you can't just kind of uh, email Matt and say, actually, oh, oh, I've missed that deadline, is that okay? You know, um, I, I, sometimes when you read to those, you, do you hit, uh, you know, histories and stuff like that, you do see things where that seems to have happened, where an artist has sort of um, taken too long to do pages or whatever, or writer hasn't sort of... Um, delivered scripts the way they were meant to be or stuff. And then somehow, like, because it's a weekly comic, they have to go find something else to, to bridge that gap or, or whatever. Um, but when you're sort of solely doing this, um, you really have to take the responsibility and and, um, kind of, and just try to work in uh, the, the schedule and, and the deadlines, which I did manage to do. I mean, I think, um, as I said, breaking it down into that sort of daily... Um, to help and um and also you know, there would be days where I would do more than that and so on you know and but I think I would try to and once I got started I think once I delivered the first sort of installment I thought right okay that yeah I think that's what I need to do. just keep doing it in that way um so I think it was a bit of a sort of learning curve 
and actually, you know, after doing like say the A to E's and so on, um, I think once I'd done that, and once I got the feedback from Matt as well, that he was quite happy with it. Um, apart from, I did start to stray. It's quite difficult, is that like you start to get into maybe doing critiques rather. Than, um, you know, the situation of course usually should be more about sort of um, this artist did this after moving on from such a project or whatever. Then you start, to, you know, and sometimes you can't help yourself. I think you start saying, well. Story name omitted was rubbish, basically, you know, and I'm like, um, <laughs> and Matt kind of did sort of come back to me and say, well, you know, that may well have been rubbish, but, you know, this is not the place for that. So, we, you know, this, this is a sort of it's a resource. And um, and I knew that myself, you know, I think it's just sometimes you can't help it, you know, um, it's just your own instincts and your own sometimes memories of a story maybe sometimes get in the way and you have to be a bit more um, objective about it. So uh, all those things were all learning curves along the way, I think, you know. Um, it was it was always one of the, the nice bits of feedback I had on the, the 2080 ABC um, mm. videos when people were, oh, it's actually really nice to hear you, you know, voice an opinion about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it, it, and I tried to not do it as much, but um, sometimes you, you read something, you go, oh, I've got to say something about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't let this go past. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah. In fact, yeah. I can also um, maybe say probably influenced by yourself on that as well because obviously I did watch all the ABCs too. And then uh, yeah, it was me like, um, I thought, yeah, well, Mike's doing that. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of that to be honest. You know, and I thought, yeah, well, Mike's voice in his opinion, yeah, maybe I should do the same. And then it was like, no, <laughs> no probably not. Um, so yeah, no, yeah, I need to say thanks to you for sort of helping on some of those. Um, stories as well, you know, so it's just something you just need a starting point, you know, and then uh, the ABCs were a great um, resource for that as well. We, uh, I, I need to finish those at some point. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's difficult to do them in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. when working from home, to be honest with you. Well, of course you don't, again, it's roughly the same idea, you don't have access to the, the physical pages and so on, yeah. So one, one question I, I did want to ask is, um, what's really noticeable is that uh, on select St uh, strips, particularly Judge Dredd, you've broken out um, specific characters. So, you know, mm -hmm. if, if everything else is is um, series-based, but then on, on specific ones, you you, you go you like Aaron A. Aardvark and Judge Cal and, you know, the yeah. recognisable ones. What was the decision process behind that? Because obviously that's treating strips differently. Um, and yeah. I, you know, I know what the obvious answer is. It, it's Judge Dredd, so why wouldn't you? But it kind of, you know, it it, it creates a um, uh, a level of granular detail for for that that you're not necessarily getting for the other one. So I wonder what the the, the thought yeah. process behind that was. That one, um, I think, um, it was part of my initial brief. Really, was like um, all the series in um, 2000 AD and the magazine, but it did also say um, significant supports and characters as well. Now that did, I did have to admit, I was like, well, I could be make it even more tricky. You know, I mean, if it was just series, you know, fair enough. But, you know, it's, it's a good challenge, you know, but then you do come to the point there where you just have to um, make a decision on it and think, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get the kind of the memorable, as you say, Judge Carl, that's uh, an obvious one. Um, yeah, the dark judges, uh, there's loads of dark judges in there, you know, like, and it, that was one of those with the big sprawling ones, you know, where it's just, a, there's more and more material as you, the fall of dead world and all that stuff and it just seemed to be never ending but I, I, I love trying to tie in even more stuff you know I love trying to put even more into it you know um, but in terms of the, yeah so as it was it was really part of Matt's brief was to have important characters well I think it just I just had to what I did use as a um, the, 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 the architecture of the, the whole project really is um, uh, Barney the online um online database. Barney has lot, actually got lots of uh, supporting characters on there as well. So definitely just did, had to use that really as a, as a sort of like um, the structure on which the, the AP could sort of um, hang on or else I would have, I, I think I would have been there. The, the deadlines would have been missed, you know, and I was like, um, yeah, but what obscure character can you get from, um, you know, uh, you know, Quantum dogs or something like that, you know, that spin off from spin off uh, and so on. Um, so I just kind of had to sort of, I did use um, Barney as a sort of basis for it. And then where where I thought it was justified, we could use, you know, you could um, maybe say someone like, say, Judge Smiley or whatever. But as you say, the, the Dread World 
lent itself more naturally to the supporting characters. Um, I tried to sort of use people from, say, like Nikolai Dante or Sinister Dexter, you know, the big ongoing series that had a significant kind of supporting cast. And it was just a matter of kind of picking and choosing those people. Um, and then uh, just to try and cap it there, if you know what I mean, that was like we, we, had to, we have to stop somewhere. <laughs> So, you know, as, as I said, 2000 AD is a, um, constantly changing, constantly evolving. And and even since the magazine supplement started, there's been new series that <laughs> have debuted that don't yeah. have, you know, didn't have entries in the in the magazine, but 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 do have uh, 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 entries in the actual encyclopedia book. What was what was the cutoff point for that? <laughs> it was really just timing, to be honest. Um, I think I actually submitted my last part of the the serialized version um, at the end of March 2021. So um, and then the the book version was really imminent after that. So um, I just did my best to get um, some of the more recent sort of regimes in there, like say Action Pact, uh, Mayflies, and so that so I did a little appendix at the end of the final serialized version. But beyond that, um, there just really wasn't the scope to to add even more, you know. Um, so, but yeah, there's probably even already say two or three new series or something like that. Um, so that um, so really that was the cut off point. It was um, just end of March, and we just do a quick sort of. Um, of idea up of anything that I wanted to fix for the, the book version of it. And then really it was expressed thereafter. Mm-hmm. Is it, had, has there been um, a process of uh, going back over um, the, uh, the, the, the entries that you'd already done after they appeared in the Meg just to, you know, tidy things up or, or uh, you know, account for things that hadn't, hadn't made it in? Um, yeah, there was a couple of things that um, I just wanted to reword slightly. One was on uh, Judge Bruce, um, and I I just got a little confused myself about um, the the timeline of because he appeared in a, a one off appearance in uh, Skiz Three. Um, I thought I wanted to tidy that up properly and make, have it make more sense. So things that I knew, I thought well, I probably could have maybe uh, worded that a bit better. Uh, so just uh, there was, to be honest, it was really kind of minor sort of um, corrections. I just think we just didn't have the time to do a major sort of overhaul of the whole manuscript itself. I think it was pretty sound, you know. I mean, it was all sort of it was as up to date as it could be at that time, you know. I think um, because the the book version is coming, you know, not long after it's just finished in the the magazine, there really um, there wasn't a huge amount of time to sort of um, go through the whole lot and. Um, with it, which I mean, I probably would have quite liked that, but I think um, yeah, that way madness lies was probably probably just as well. We did, <laughs> yeah. but certainly, yeah, of course, we did look at things to see if there's anything what we want to fix. Um, but there was very very minor things. Is is there a, a, a series or a character that this process has um, introduced you to and has become a favourite? Is there, you know, is there, is there something where, you, where, where you've got actually? I, I, I really like this. hadn't either hadn't known about it or hadn't paid attention to it before. Um, yeah, I have to admit as well. There, there has been a, a few years where I sort of got out of the way of reading 2018 as well, and that was from about um, 20, 20, 15, 20, 15. I just sort of um, with it, again with like say house moves and stuff. You start you get rid of all the stuff, unfortunately, and you sort of lose. You know, you don't keep up with it. So, um, so one that I did mention again er- earlier was grey area, and I thought, um, having you know read it from cover to cover, basically, um, it was just that that one really stayed with me. I thought it was a great story, and sort of the political element was sort of um, very nicely handled. You know, um, and even just the title itself was just sort of indicative of what it was all about, and uh, just thought that was a really great idea and superbly drawn and so on and um and and obviously coming back and um, right up to date as well and um, it's just something that be out it just seemed to just sort of hit the moment didn't it? you know it was all about sort of um we're in lockdown and, um but this is about what it would be like to just be free to roam the you know the universe and so on so things like that um well there's loads you know it was great to sort of um revisit things that i loved when i because uh I started reading to those at the age of nine, and in 1981. So that was just um, right at the time that uh, Ace Truck and Go started. It was like the next week. It was like 
episode one of Ace Trucking, and that was just great to have a look at that again. I really enjoy just how mad it was, you know. I mean, but and and also it was sort of um, it was quite it had a nice light touch to it. So um, it wasn't all sort of you know death and violence and, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so it was great to be the nostalgic stuff was great as well because you, you then you you sort of um, you look back at that time. In 1981, it was like an apocalypse, you know, block mania, apocalypse war. Then you've got Strontium Dogs absolutely at the top of its game. Um, Nemesis the Warlock, um, Rogue Troopers just started. So you've got, that's a real kind of, as they say, they called it like the gold mirror or something like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was, you know. Um, and so it's great to revisit all that stuff. And then it's nice to find some new great stuff as well. And um I do remember reading Zombo at the time and thoroughly enjoying it. And, um, it was great just to sort of look through all those again, just to sort of remind myself. And you think, yeah, I mean, I think um, some of the the comedy series are actually really quite well done. I think um, Dandridge, uh, it was great to rediscover that. I thought that you know, that's in, in its later story, uh, uh, stories. Eventually, you know, there were really some very funny stuff in there. You know? I think that's a classic that people would sort of. Maybe want to revisit if they, you know, if they read the entry on it or something like that. So I think, yeah, I think that's um, it's great to rediscover some things. Also, I uh, reread um, Skiz and was shed a tear at the end of the first book and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> so stuff like that um, it just shows you how good it was. You know, because I, I, I guess the, the 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 difficulty with a book like this is it needs to appeal to both uh, the hardcore fandom. Yeah. You will know an awful lot of it already, if not all of it. But also to to not casual readers, but but people who aren't necessarily steeped in the law. And that and that's quite a a tightrope to walk, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um I, I hope I've managed to kind of have a foot in both camps, if you know what I mean. I think I'm always wary that um I do wonder sometimes that I was concerned that I was like spoiling all these stories for people, you know, like because I'm explaining everything that happens to them, you know, like well, no need to read any of them since he's going to spoil it all. Um, but I don't think so. I think I mean hopefully there's just enough in certain aspects, or, or rather there's just enough, or else it just can't be avoided. You know, um, if you're going to do an entry on the dead man, then you you have to know who, what you know, what identity. Is, well, I'll try not to spoil it, you know. So, but I do it in the book, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think um, it obviously has to please um, long term fans. Um, but at the same time, I think it really does have to appeal to people who are new fans. Maybe they've got into it through Regines, which is that it's remit. So, uh, it has to appeal to them as well. And I'll hopefully, um, I've managed to try and sort of spin all those plates and, and make it. Um, you know, make it in a way that's appealing to everyone. Obviously, you're not gonna you're not gonna please everyone. I maybe just have to accept that, but I want to. <laughs> All right. So I, I, one one of the things that's been really uh, fascinating has has been watching the, uh, the 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 editors and the designers kind of working away at this, like uh, like, mm. like busy little workarounds. Um, and and driving themselves mad and and but doing you know doing a great job to fit the sheer amount of of information into in, into the space. I mean you know that that that's a, a a task kind of almost equivalent to having done the the writing in the first place. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was absolutely gobsmacked at how much you know amazing work that all the the designers and the editors as well. Um, have done, but in, I would say particularly the designers, because as you say, they have to like find this relevant material and get it, put it together, and then make it appealing to to the to the eye. You know, I mean, I think it's just they, they did an astounding job, and I can't thank them enough because I've never even met them or uh, had an email from them. You know, you, you feel you know when you're freelance like that, you are quite detached um, from the process. So all I had to do is just fire off some work. Worry about that part of it. So um, it was really, really great, and I can't thank them enough. And also Matt and um, Olivia, who edited the the book version as well. So yeah, great job from all of them. Um, I'm just it's really great to see uh, the, you know the finished product. Yeah.
Great. Well, thank you so much to Scott for that. Now, as I said at the beginning, it's Thought Bubble this weekend, and we've got a couple of teasers um, about the uh, talent search panels that we run every year. Now, uh, there are a number of creators who've come through these and actually got regular work with 2018, which is fantastic. So it's an opportunity to uh, put people through their paces, whether they're submitting a pitch for a future shock or whether they're submitting artwork from a sample script for the art competition. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we have already chosen the winners, uh, having done the uh, panels earlier uh, today, uh, So, but you'll have to wait until the weekend. But this is an opportunity just to hear from our judges about what their expectations are for this weekend's Thought Bubble uh, Talent Search panels. So it's uh, great to welcome uh, Maura, Ram and Oliver, uh, who are the uh, judges for the 2000 AD uh, Thought Ball Script Talent Search 2021. Um, I mean, first off, uh, thanks all three of you for uh, for agreeing to be this year's uh, judges. It's um, It's been quite a process of oh. sifting through these. Um, we had, uh, I think it was over 100... I think we had 107 entries. Excellent. Um, which uh, uh, is, is an all-time high. So, you know, great. Thank you to everybody who, 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 uh, who put in their, um, uh, their pitches. Uh, um, I wanted to give ahead of the, the um, actual judging panel this weekend as part of Thought Bubble, I wanted to, to give people a taster of, of kind of what we're, what we're looking for, what people can expect, because Maura, you've been a, a judge before on the panel, haven't you? Yeah, um, last year. Yeah, so I wanted to get an idea of, of you know, what, what you're looking for in, in one of these four-page stories. So, uh, Maura, uh, looking back on, on last year, um, what was your overriding um, uh, feeling uh, about, uh, about the pictures that we, that we had? <laughs> Well, first off, I, th I always think how brave people are to do this, actually, because not only are you putting together a written pitch, you're also sending a video pitch, which is really difficult and actually not really what writers often do uh, to certainly the video part. So um, I commend all of them for the bravery of doing that and putting yourself forward. I mean, we all um, have projection when we're writers. All of us have had it. So, uh, you know, of the hundred and, you know, plus people who submitted, you know, we're bringing it down to, what is it, five? So that that's, you know, that's a lot of disappointed people. I would just say keep writing. <laughs> but the main thing is you're looking for a full story. And because it's future shocks, something with perhaps hopefully a bit of a twist or a turn uh, and with interesting characters and something oh, I actually really like if it's fun, <laughs> not some, you know, dour. There's a lot of sort of very serious stuff. So and, and variety and inventiveness, you know, simple stuff to get into four pages. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ram, I mean, uh, this is this is your first time on the panel. Yeah. Um, uh, future shocks. I, I, I know I've I've seen um, uh, particularly uh, writers who've come up to uh, American comics mm. and have twenty two pages a month uh, mm. to play with. Um, when when they first hear about future shocks, their their jaws drop and they kind of go a bit white and sweaty at the, right. at the idea of, of compressing a story like this. Right. Um, what what what's What's your feelings about the, the Future Shock as a format? I think it's great. Um, and I think, frankly, if you don't know how to compress story, then then you're, you're missing, you know, some tools in your toolbox. Um, I think the the era of decompressed storytelling is certainly predominant today in, in American comics. But, um, you know, at least my work, um, you know, is generally known for... You're like, oh, I read 20 pages, but it feels like I've read way more story than that in, in, in the span of 20 pages. And part of that is visual compression, part of that is narrative compression. And so if you if you don't know how to do that, then you're you're certainly missing part of the narrative toolkit. Um and, and I think future shocks, short stories, even thinking of, I mean, I generally tend to think of my scenes as four-page stories, uh, even within a 20 page, 22 page book. Um, and so I think reading and trying to write my own future shocks at home uh, was certainly a, an important 
part of the exercise. So I'm quite excited to see what people have come up with. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, did you ever uh, try to picture a future shock through the open submissions? No, no, I didn't. Um, partly, partly because I think the first year I considered doing that is when like the pitching process moved into uh, the thought bubbles kind of big festival when <laughs> you come in and pitch here. And uh, as, as Maura was saying before, like, I'm not brave enough to pitch anything on video. So if you're, if you're, if you're not looking at my, if you're not looking at my, uh, you know, one page, 500 word pitch, uh, then, you know, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Oliver, uh, you're a graphic novel editor at Rebellion. Um, when, uh, when we think back to the classic future shocks, you know, the, 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 the Alan Moores, the Pete Milligans, the John Smiths, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes it can, it can, it can feel like, they're, they're, they're so perfect. They're so nicely done. But of course, this this is a, 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 a rite of passage for a lot of writers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think something uh, you have to remember is that not every future shock Alan Moore wrote was chronocops. He only wrote <laughs> one chronocops. Uh, and, and future shocks were in so many progs, and many of them are good, but they're not perfect. Um, I remember Al Ewing saying in, in an interview when he was starting writing that um, he couldn't imagine himself writing Watchmen, but he, he could imagine himself writing a bad Alan Moore future shock. And I, if you're starting that off, that, that's what you're aiming for. You know, you want to, you know, at least try and write a four page story that builds each page builds on the last page. Um, ending in a, a quirky twist that, is, that as Morris says, uh, has a sense of humor, a sense of fun that keeps you interested. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm looking forward to the uh, uh, to the entries for this year's uh, Thought Bubble, which will be revealed on the weekend of the show on the, the, the uh, YouTube channel for Thought Bubble. Uh, so uh, good luck, everyone. And yeah. to the judges, because <laughs> it's not an envious task um, to, uh, to, to to go through these. So, yeah, uh, it should be fun. So uh, we now have a, a different set of judges for the uh, Thought Bubble Art Competition, which is uh, uh, happening this weekend long time, uh, alongside the, the, the script talent search. And we have uh, three judges two artists and one graphic novel editor, but is also a, a comic book creator in, uh, in their own right. Um, we've got uh, Olivia Hicks. Hello. We've got Dougie Braithwaite. Hey. And we've got Leanna Kangas. Hey. So uh, the, 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 the format of the, uh, of, the script, of the art competition is much the same. People have, uh, have drawn uh, pages from a, a sample script and sent them through. Mathag the Mighty has chosen uh, uh, some uh, five finalists, and uh, we're going to go through and decide who gets paid work with uh, with 2000 AD. Uh, Liana, what are the kind of things that you you look for when you find a new artist? Uh, when you're looking to find a new artist, what are the things that really stand out to you? Yeah, um, I think style, like a unique style, because comics medium is such a you know vast uh, you know thing unique style and uh, seamless storytelling is pretty important. And um, I think those are my main two The you know, I see it when I see it, I guess, which is the hard part. Uh, Dougie, you, you started your career with 2080 back in the late eighties, 89. Um, what were the, uh, and, and this is where Olivia pipes up and mentions that she wasn't even born then. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what what uh, what did what did you learn in those early days from being at, at 2080, and what are your expectations coming into to this judging? Well, um, I learned a lot. Um, you had some great professionals um, that were very encouraging to me, and uh, um, you know, I wasn't afraid of asking questions from you know if if there's something that really confused me, you know, I wouldn't be afraid to ask, and they actually. Uh, expected me to, you know, they wanted to see me come up to them, ask some questions, you know, so, um, and, you know, I'd expect that of any young 
upcoming eyes to do the same thing. You know, don't be afraid to ask the professionals if you get the opportunity to, you know, because um, most of them are very accommodating uh, to, to, you know, just pick their brains, you know, and um, hopefully they'll be able to pass stuff on to you. But, um, yeah, I, I started pretty young and I was very raw. But as I said, I had good people around me and uh, they encouraged me and uh, made me feel like it was a profession that I wanted to stay in. So, yeah. And what are your expectations of, of what we're going to see today? Um, well, I'm, I'm like Leona said, I'm looking for um, somebody who's you know, got a very individual kind of voice, uh, style. Um, somebody could tell the story very clearly um, and somebody sticks to the brief. Um, you know, I've, I've, we've all seen the script and I think uh, it's a very, um, quite a sophisticated story, you know, in six pages. So there's a lot of information there that they're going to have to try and absorb and, and, and kind of put across to the reader. So this is what I'm looking for and hopefully we'll find, uh, find somebody who could do that. Brilliant. And, and, and Olivia, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're producing your own comics while also working at uh, Rebellion as a, a, a junior graphics novel editor. Um, uh, is this the kind of thing that uh, that, that you, you relish or dread? Um, looking at other people's artwork. Mm. Um, I love looking at other people's artwork. Okay. I think... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate looking at art. <laughs> That's why I'm in Never comics. Know. That's why I asked. Um, <laughs> no, I think like um, Doug and Leanna said, I'm looking for something individual that makes me want to know more. It doesn't necessarily have to be like the most anatomically correct story, like style. It just has to be interesting and dynamic and make me want to read more of it. I think if the style's interesting, then I'm not going to be like, well, the perspective was a little bit off in the back of that panel because I think to me, I'm more interested in like the style and the individuality and the charisma of the art, if I can be really pretentious. And I think we're looking, yeah, I agree. We're looking for somebody who can tell the story really clearly. I think I also like, as a lazy writer, I like artists who can elevate the script. <laughs> so um, artists who are like, trying to think in like that extra level and bringing something else and bringing another thing to that script that a, a novel is because they're also telling the story so like you know seeing their storytelling chops as well in things that maybe is missed off in the script or isn't the script and they're bringing that on so I think that's also what I would be looking for well, super to hear from all of those judges and uh, yeah I I think they made the right decisions in the end for the panels, but uh, like I said, you'll have to wait until this weekend. Enjoy Thought Bubble. For those of you who are going, do make sure you stay safe, but have a good time. Um, we should be back in two weeks' time for more from the greatest uh, podcast in the galaxy. So until then, uh, let's stay safe, take care of one another, and splendid verse rig. Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.